morning, good afternoon, or good evening at whatever hour it is. I'm glad that you guys joined us. Uh, we are going to continue our uh, good uh, study series on the names of God. Today we're going to be <clears throat> learning a little bit about El Elyon, God Most High, or phrased also the Most High God. The term El Elyon, uh, as we have been told uh, previously from our other lessons, the, the term El means God in itself. And Elyon, in its generic sense, simply means the highest position of an entity. That's what Elyon means. It means the highest position of an entity. I would like to quickly get our spiritual appetites wet as it pertains to what is considered the most high in general. And as we move on, we will learn specifically about God most high, El Elyon in particular. So let's qu play quickly a game identifying the highest position. So who can tell me what is the highest position in the U.S. military ranks? Is it four-star or five-star general? No, there is one rank higher, and that is the General Lissimo. He is considered a six-star general, okay? He is the general of armies and is superior to the field marshal and other five-star ranks. He would be the commander of the combined military forces of the Army, Navy, and Air Force units. I'm choosing all of these illustrations for to fold neatly into our lesson today. Okay. Was that position of six-star Generalissimo ever fulfilled? Yes, it was. It was fulfilled at one time in our history. It was filled by the General of the Armies, Generalissimo, John Joseph Pershing, okay? He was the senior United States officer. His most famous post was when he served as the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, the AEF, of the Western Front during World War I. He was the General of Armies, okay? And his service number was 0-1 meaning none were higher. What's the highest official in our current U.S. government? The many people might consider, well, the president. But technically not. The highest ranking official in the U.S. government, technically, and I say technically, is the chief justice. He is the highest ranking official. He is basically the co-equal of the judiciary branch of the federal government. And many might say, well, why is the president not? The president is not the highest ranking official because the Senate technically has higher authority. The Senate body has higher authority than the president himself. Okay. The chief justice that individual actually has autonomous authority when it comes down to his single vote or his single vote. Now, let's move. We're going to move more in line with the highest authorities of our lesson today. What is the highest ranking position in a land or group of lands? Is it an emperor or is it a king or is it maybe a pharaoh? The highest ranking position in the lands is really an emperor. An emperor is higher than a king because an emperor is a king of kings. He is the king of kings. So if you are a Bible student, you know where I'm going with this when I say he is a king of kings. These teasers were just designed to help us think beyond our basic understanding of what are considered some of the highest positions in our lives and those who hold earthly roles in those positions. Now let's quickly look 
at what is the significance or relevance of the name El Elyon. Why is it important for God, that is Yahweh, to identify himself to his covenant people as God Most High? It was important because they, his covenant nation, along with us today, need to know that Yahweh has always retained ultimate authority or reigns, or most accurately put, he retains sovereign authority over every aspect of the universe. Yahweh has absolute authority over any and all matters and is not affected by no individual or outside forces. This is the understanding of El Elyon, God Most High, or as often said, the Most High God. We're going to begin our brief study this morning from probably one of the most familiar single verses or a couple of verses associated with the names of God. And this particular verse has been used with several other names. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis 14, and I'm just going to read verses 17 through 19. Okay. And I'm going to read from what's called the Amplified this morning because it has a, a, a rich or a broader text. And verse 17 reads, from chapter 14 reads, and this is from the book of Genesis. It says, after his, and this is referencing Abram, after Abram's return from the defeat and slaying of Ketaleomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, which was later called Jerusalem, we know as Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine for their nourishment. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Bless, blessed, favored with blessings, be Abram by God Most High. Possessor and maker of heaven and earth. Okay. When Abram returned from defeating Ketoleomer, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shabbat. Okay. And he gives an identification which is going to assist us in our definition and understanding of El Elyon. Okay. It's from this short, brief passage that we can extract a good portion of the meaning of El Elyon, of the spiritual meaning of El Elyon, not the generic. We're going to look at the spiritual meaning now. I would first like to state that the phraseology of God Most High was not uncommon to the people for that time period. It was used and clearly understood by virtually all of the inhabitants of that day. Melchizedek, in his unique personage as a priest of El Elyon, is the first individual to use this designation. How does he first define, how does Melchizedek first define El Elyon? Melchizedek defines El Elyon first, and it's right here in the passage. He defines El Elyon as the creator of heaven and earth. So this is the first definition of understanding who El Elyon is. Therefore, if we connect the dots, sovereignty or the unapproachable authority to reign is derived as a natural byproduct of being creator of heaven and earth. Let me read that again. Therefore, if we connect the dots, sovereignty or the unapproachable authority to reign 
is derived as a natural byproduct of being the creator of heaven and earth. Stated another way, being the sole creator places the entirety of creation under Yahweh's sovereign rule. This leads us to the second identifier or definer of the Most High God, which comes from verse 20. Melchizedek states that he who has delivered your foes into your hands. Now, connecting the dots here requires a little more understanding. As we know so well this story, we know that Abram and the men of his household, who were not necessarily warriors, though valiant men, they totaled in number 318. We get this from Scripture. But this 318 men, and, and believe me, I'm going to tie this into El Elyon, this 318 men defeated five armies led by Ketoleomer. You might say, well, why is this uh, necessary? Well, we need to understand Ketoleomer's army. Ketoleomer had just defeated the Rephaim, the Zuzim, the Emites, and the Horites. For those that don't know, the Rephaim were literally giants who inhabited the earth. The Emites were also another class of giants. The Zuzim and the Horites, those were fighting class nations. You might say, why is this important? This is important because the five armies of Ketoleomer were a warring machine. The five armies of Ketoleomer who defeated these armies literally of giants, they were considered a warring machine. But El Elyon, the God Most High, it was his power it was his unapproachable power. It was his sovereign power that defeated these warring armies with basically 318 herdsmen. So where are we going with this? Where am I going with this? We need to understand the point made here is that El Elyon, in his sovereignty, that is his independent rule over the universe, allowed not one life to be lost by a small company of 318 herdsmen who defeated five armies of at least the bare minimum of tens of thousands of seasoned warriors. This understanding of Yahweh's dominion begins to help us understand the sovereign rule of El Elyon. The second understanding of Yahweh as El Elyon and his sovereignty involves the fact that all other powers, whether earthly powers or demonic powers, clearly know that permission must be granted by El Elyon in order for God's elect to be tried or tested by them. In other words, God places limits on earthly rulers and Satan who can go no farther than El Elyon allows. This sovereignty is illustrated in the Bible. It's illustrated in several passages. We can look at Luke, the 22nd chapter, and we see that God places limits on Satan who can go no farther than he is allowed. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. In other words, Satan had to speak. He had to speak to God. He had to seek permission from El Elyon to sift Peter. Note that Jesus was praying for Peter and he is also praying, and the application is, Jesus is also praying for us. 
he is praying to El Elyon, the God most high for us. As we experience circumstances through which we will be tempted or tried by Satan. Similarly, Satan could do no harm to Job without the permission from El Elyon. And to not go into all of the verses, but I would love to, we can look at uh, Job 1 and 8, 1 and 9, 1 10, and we can go through Job 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. If we read those passages, those passages clearly tell us that it is Satan and he is trying to seek permission to harm us through El Elyon. El Elyon's rule is also over, the, he also has the sovereignty over earthly rulers. And we're going to look at, if we turn to Daniel, to the third chapter of Daniel, and the examples of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar addressed the three as whom? He addressed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as servants of the Most High God. That comes from Daniel, the third chapter, uh, verses 26, 27, and 28. Note that they are convinced, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are convinced that El Elyon could deliver them and yet were ready to burn if God allowed them to, okay? When God permits Satan, in this case, in this particular hist historical event, when God permits Satan to light the furnace, you can be confident that he keeps his hand on the thermostat. And this is proven. Nebuchadnezzar addressed the three servants as servants of the God Most High. Note that they are convinced that El Elyon could deliver them, and yet they were ready to burn if God had allowed. Our final application I would like to give us today, the final application of understanding El Elyon is to know God as the Most High God. He is sovereign over everything, and everyone is, and everyone, and we need to understand in this particular case, everyone and everything is an empowering doctrine. For if you truly believe that he is sovereign, no mere human can intimidate you. You'll respect authority, but you won't cringe before it. If you know El Elyon, if you know God as El Elyon, you know that God is sovereign. Then you can be content and even find joy in the midst of circumstances that are less than ideal. If you know that God is, if you know God as El Elyon, if you know that God is sovereign in that name, then you will be encouraged in evangelism because you understand that winning the lost is not your job. Your job is to share the gospel, tell your testimony, talk about Jesus, look for opportunities, and pray for open doors but it's God's job to sovereignly lead us, to empower us, to give us those open doors. And then when we share Christ to convict the world and create them a hunger for him and his word. If you know God is El Elyon, if you know God is sovereign, then you can know that he will